All good? Aha, excellent. Welcome, everybody, to the final session. Uh, I'm going to kick off now because we have got a ton of information to cover today. Okay, just an absolute ton. So the sort of speed of today's talk is we're going to start off basic and then we're going to ramp up, okay? So get ready for a wave of information to come over you because this is going to be uh, pretty intense and especially for the final session of the conference. Um, but don't fret because, of course, these videos are all recorded and this presentation is designed to be just kind of viewed later on as well, okay? So don't feel like you need to, you know, uh, get writer's cramp by trying to keep up. Um, so, Identity Server 4, Angular 2, and ASP.NET Core. These are the three things I'm going to be covering today. The main part of the, fo uh, the main focus of the talk is Identity Server 4. Okay, uh, Angular, I'm going to show you how I've set up my Angular 2 application, or whatever version of Angular they're up to these days. Um, and the reason I include ASP.NET Core is because all of what I'm doing today runs on ASP.NET Core, okay, including Angular. So keep that in mind. Um, but yes, the focus is definitely on Identity Server 4. Um, and I'm super excited, and I'm a little bit scared, a little bit nervous. And that is because the code we're looking at today is my real-world application. Okay, this is running in production. There's commented code around the place. There's probably rubbish bits and pieces here and there. Um, and I'm just literally loading up my solution. Uh, and so if you see a key, you didn't see a key. <laughs> If you see a password, you didn't. Uh, I have to rotate them every time I do this talk, uh, which is good practice for me anyway. It forces me to do it. Um, so as a bit of context for why I'm here today, uh, about a year ago, I decided to begin a startup uh, in the payments industry. I used to work for a payments company. Uh, it was rubbish. Their systems were awful. It was mainly VB6. All of the logic was installed procedures. Um, and I thought, oh, I could do such a better job than these guys. Now, it turns out I learned a lesson a little later on. It doesn't matter how good your code is if people are willing to pay for your product. And the other way around, basically, it's your sales team that makes a product. And I only wanted you know, a little application. I didn't want a unicorn. I'm happy with just a tiny little business that works and earns a little bit of money. Um, I'm happy with the doge of applications. Um, so I started out as you would with, you know, any good startup should, is you find the MVP, right? You find the simplest thing that will work, that you can hand to someone, and they can go, oh, that's cool, here's some money. And so I started off with an architecture that looks like this. Now, being a payments company, I rely on the banks to do all of my transfers under the hood. And if anyone has ever worked with a bank, you might understand what's happening here. It took me nine months to get access to the systems I needed. Nine months. It was ridiculously slow. Uh, and so, as with any kind of developer who's got some time on his hands, you know, I ended up with uh, an architecture that looked like this. So, <laughs> rather than actually, you know, working on uh, finding customers, talking to, you know, business people and that kind of thing, I thought, oh, you know what, I'll just add one more little thing. I'll just investigate one more technology, because I want my product to be you know, super solid and really, really great for developers. Uh, because the whole point of my product is to let developers access payment systems easily. Okay? And this is where Identity Server uh, really shines. But perhaps I shouldn't have gone so far. So I now have quite a complex uh, system architecture. But uh, at least I know the intricacies of all these systems now, because I've spent a long time gold plating them. So anyway, we want to build something like this, right? We want to build an API that we can give out to developers, and we want solid systems that are protected uh, with using Identity Server. So where do we start? With beer. That's right. If you don't know me, I'm Ben who likes beer. Um, I was working on the beer that was at the party last night with Ulsmia, uh, and so I really enjoyed that. If you saw the videos on Facebook, you can see just how excited I was to go out and visit this brewery. Uh, but if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can follow me there. Um, it's probably the easiest place to find blog posts or something like that about this kind of stuff. Um, just really quickly, I was a solution architect at SSW. That was a year ago. I still do a little bit of work for them. Uh, I like payments. I like beer. There's untapped. If you haven't seen that yet, you should install it. Follow me. I'm Ben Cull. Um, and I'm working on the startup, which is, of course, Pinch. Um, pinch payments. Uh, and so this is the code we're going to be looking at today. Okay. Now, just before we dive into code, I want to cover 
just a little bit about ASP.NET Core and why I chose that as my platform and why you might want to do that yourself as well. Um, I guess the first reason is the latest version of Identity Server runs on ASP.NET Core. So if you're using that, then you're going to need to use ASP.NET Core. So who's using ASP.NET Core here already? OK, cool. That's about three quarters of the audience. Um, for those of you who aren't convinced yet, things are fast. OK, things are pretty damn quick. And you don't have to do anything to you know, reap these performance benefits. Uh, everything that they're doing now, they're focusing on performance. Um, it's highly composable. And this is kind of comes back to Identity Server as well, right? It's just a package that gets put into an MVC website. Um, it's really easy to write these extension points and write these products that just slide into other applications. So using ASP.NET Core makes things a lot easier to compose. Um, it's got all the attention right now, OK? You've got Damien and David working on this stuff and all these teams working on this stuff all the time. Uh, now, this is a double-edged sword. It changes every week, which if you're not developing every week, is a pain in the ass. So uh, it's good because it has attention, and it's getting updates, and they're making things better and better, but then they're changing it all the time too. And so that is a little bit annoying if you're not ready for pain and breakage. Um, and probably my main point, especially for people newer to ASP.NET, um, it's easier to do the right thing. So it kind of funnels you towards success. With the built-in dependency injection, uh, it kind of makes you architect your solution in a way that sets you up for success. Okay? It, it makes it uh, a good or guides you towards good architecture. Uh, and just a quick point on, on performance. Here's a quick slide from this week. Um, all of this stuff's in Azure. Uh, and you, you can look at this and you can see, OK, yeah, things are coming back under 200 milliseconds. The page, it's an Angular page, so it takes a little bit to load here and there. Um, There's fairly steady requests. Someone at Azure tripped over the power cord in the middle there and they plugged it back in. Hence the failed requests. Um, and you might think, OK, yeah, that's not bad. I mean, but you've got to remember that this is on Australian servers. OK? This is on Australian internet, which is rubbish. And so these speeds are actually pretty decent. Um, they say that in Australia, we have 100, megabyte, uh, 100 megabits down and up. The problem is the whole country has to share. <laughs> so ASP.NET Core is a good idea. OK? It, it's, it's nice. It's fun to use, and it's, uh, it's performant. And the first thing you do when you begin a project, usually one of the earlier things you do, is you need to think about security and authentication mainly. Okay? Pretty much every system has a user that needs to log into that system. Um, and this is where we're going to start talking about identity service specifically. Now, over the last year, it's been kind of scary. There's been a lot of data breaches. There's been you know, a lot of security threats. And even myself, if you haven't seen Have I Been Pwned by Troy Hunt, uh, it's a fantastic tool. It tells you when you've, you've had a data breach against your email account. You can see I've been breached five times. Things like uh, LinkedIn, GitHub, uh, Ashley Madison. Hopefully not. <laughs> uh, and so I asked Troy, I was a bit scared. I said, I need some advice. What can I do to make my application secure? Because I'm not a security expert. I, I just want to make good applications. And he gave me some great advice. But I think what he meant to say is don't roll your own security. Okay, there are tools in the box that can do this for you, and there is safety in numbers when you uh, all rely on Microsoft and these kinds of smart people to take care of this kind of stuff for you. Um, and so when I talk about security in an ASP.NET Core world, we're talking about two things. Uh, ASP.NET identity, which takes care of storing usernames and passwords, and identity server that takes care of bearer authentication and giving out tokens. Now, a quick, quick quiz here. Uh, sorry, quick poll here. Who's used ASP.NET Identity in .NET Core so far? Yep. And who's used Identity Server before as well? Okay. So about half the room ASP.NET Identity, and about a third, I think, have used Identity Server, which is good because we're going to start off with the basics and how to get up and running, and then I'm going to shove you into the things that aren't in the documentation. Okay. The things that you won't be able to find or do easily because it's so flexible. Um, so as I said, we'll look at ASP.NET identity first. And its job is just to save usernames and passwords in the database. Essentially, it'll log you into an MVC website. You can use cookie authentication. But the goal is basically, yes, that's what ASP.NET identity takes care of. And we'll, we'll look into that in a minute. The problem happens when you add in an API. Okay? What happens when you want to expose your data to third parties using an API? And all of a sudden, 
your you know, cookie-based authentication is not going to cut it. And so this is where we rely on the second piece of technology now, Identity Server. Because what it does is it wraps your ASP.NET Identity website, okay, the place where you log in. It wraps that up and it issues tokens uh, to your clients, your third parties, uh, to protect your API in this case. Um, but then you can also add other things. So just a couple of quick points before we dive into some code. Um, here are some scenarios where Identity Server is a good idea for you, OK? Um, the first thing is that it's compatible with any authentication system. OK, so if you're coming from a legacy application and you want to start implementing this stuff, you don't have to wrap ASP.NET Identity. You could wrap uh, an on-premises AD or an Azure AD or a custom implementation if you have one, uh, especially if it's legacy, which I hope you then update uh, to something else. Uh, it includes all of the things like Google and Facebook logins and the external um, OpenID Connect stuff. Uh, it's not quite microservices, but we are lifting a responsibility and putting it in its own place. Uh, so it's kind of one step towards segmenting your application a little bit more, um, which I like. I wouldn't call it microservices, but it's on its way. Um, you can give out different claims to different clients. So this is just about permissions. Okay, so if you want one group of people to access a certain part of your API and a different group of people to have limited access or something like that. It's very easy to do that with Identity Server and some claims. Um, if you're building a, an API that's designed to be given to third-party developers, this product is perfect. Okay? It is an excellent tool for building exactly what you need, highly flexible and powerful. And on the flip side of that, if you've got lots of your own applications, OK, you're an organization with many internal apps, and you just want to you know, use one AD uh, authentication for all of them. Uh, this is also a perfect tool for single sign-on within an organ organization. So the point of today is that we are going to look at the code that is this. We're going to spin up an ASP.NET identity server. Um, an identity server, sorry, and we're going to take a look at the code that protects our API and how our Angular 2 application is set up within MVC to make use of this identity server as well. Um, so just to give you an idea, and I apologize as well, I couldn't get duplicate to work, so I have to work from extend mode, which is a little tough. I realize the Solution Explorer is going to be a bit small, and we have to restart this as well. What we're going to do is I'm going to fire up each of the applications, and I'm going to guide you through. I'm just going to give you a quick demo of what it looks like to log in. Um, so I have an API uh, project that I've just spun up. I have an authentication project, which is just an MVC site with Identity Server inside of it. Spin that up as well. We can also spin up our website. And this will load. So one thing you'll notice when it loads, if we get internet on this side as well. One thing you'll notice when it loads is uh, we won't be logged in, or we shouldn't be logged in. And um, I'm using a pretty heavy build process, so it does take a few minutes, a couple of seconds to uh, load. Now, we uh, probably shouldn't be logged in. Maybe we will be. But what will happen is we'll load up our main application, our Angular 2 website, and immediately we'll be redirected to the authentication website where it will ask us to log in. As you can see, lightning fast. Um, and the point of this is uh, we'll log in. We'll go across. Maybe we'll skip this step and wait for it to load up in the background. Oh, no, there we go. OK, cool. Um, I also have my database migrations and my seeding of the database on startup as well. So normally, this would be spun up beforehand. Um, but essentially, what, was, what has happened is we've been um, flicked over to our authentication server. I'm going to log in using the ASP.NET Identity Provider, essentially. Uh, and when I do so, I'm redirected back to my Angular 2 application. It loads up, and it will 
start being able to use the API. So I can come over here to something like payers, uh, and it will load a list of payers. And there they are. And we can come in here and see something work like that. Cool. So we have our three pieces. We have our three pieces here. API, Identity Server, and Angular 2 Server. Um, on startup, probably something you won't realize has happened is the API project has gone and it's hit the Identity Server, has downloaded the public key. Okay, so every access token is signed using a certificate, and the public key is given to the API so that it can verify the tokens that it's receiving from the Angular 2 app. So when a normal request comes in, uh, we tried to go to the Angular 2 website, we weren't logged in, so we get redirected over to Identity Server. Token comes back once we've successfully logged in. We send that token up to the API with all of our requests. And if we have access and permission, we will get the data back. Okay, this is the general workflow of this uh, particular bit. And so now what we're going to do is build these things. So let's take a look. Sorry. Okay, cool. So what we're going to do is we're going to start, and we're just going to quickly add ASP.NET identity to our project. Okay, so the thing you need to um, uh, know about this solution is that the pinch.auth, and I know it's a little bit hard to see, but we're in one MVC project here, uh, and this one is where we're going to add uh, ASP.NET identity and also identity server. So the first thing you want to do is add your packages. All right, is that large enough for everyone to see at the back as well? Yep, sweet. Um, OK, so the first thing we're going to do is add our uh, ASP.NET identity packages. OK, and that's these two guys here. Identity and Entity Framework Core, because we're going to be using Entity Framework to connect everything together. Um, so you add those two uh, packages to your just a file new project MVC application. And then in startup, you come down here. And you'll have to bear with me and look at this in stages. Um, all we're doing is we're adding identity. You've got a few options that you can configure here. I've toned down the password requirements for easier development time stuff. Um, and the key bit is that we're adding the Entity Framework stores and pointing it at pinch context. Um, so pinch context is just a regular database context that inherits from uh, identity DB context. Okay? This can be empty. Uh, the only thing you need is the constructor here. Um, I've got a bunch of other tables in there, but for now you don't need to worry about that. The identity DB context spins up all of the user tables and the uh, role tables and all those bits that are built in. And the only thing you do need to do is provide a user. And if we look at our user class, this is just a regular entity that happens to inherit from identity user. That gives us the password and all those other uh, columns. Uh, but the user is just a basic class. Uh, so we have our context. And that is pretty much all you need to do to add identity. You can come down here to the uh, configure section. And you just need to add use identity into your pipeline. Okay, and it has to be above MVC, for those of you who don't know, because this pipeline is executed in order. MVC has to be at the bottom. Um, okay, so the other thing you'll need from that um, is the controllers and the views for things like login, register, and all that kind of thing. Now, if you go file new project, an MVC project, and you pick uh, individual accounts for authentication, you'll get given these things. Uh, we're going to change them in a minute anyway, so really all you need to do is those couple of bits uh, from a blank project and you'll, and you'll be ready to go, because what we'll do next is the next slide, we'll add identity server to this blank empty MVC project. So, starting in the same vein, we need to add a few more packages. Again, we're still in the same MVC project here. Uh, we're going to need to add Identity Server 4 as a package, the base package. And then if you look at the top here, we're also adding uh, Identity Server 4.EntityFramework and Identity Server 4.ASP.Identity. And this just 
makes it really easy to use Entity Framework and connect it to our ASP.NET identity provider. Okay, it handles pretty much most of it for us. Back into our startup uh, class, and we'll just go back up to where we were here. Um, you can see that I'm adding the database context um, in the typical built-in ASP.NET Core way. You might notice that I've got my uh, migrations assembly reference there as well, and we'll, we'll talk about migrations in just a second. Um, what we need to do is skip add identity. We've got MVC in there. That's all built in. Um, what we need to do is this uh, services.addidentity server here. Uh, and it's very similar to add identity, okay? Just move that up. Um, we've got some options that we can change. I've changed the login and logout URL. Uh, importantly, we're adding a signing certificate. We're adding two configuration store, uh, uh, two database contexts, essentially. And we're telling it to use the user table. So three really important points here, starting with the certificate. Now, as I mentioned before, whenever Identity Server generates a token, it's signing that token using a certificate. And you have the option during development time, if you'd like, uh, to come in here and go add a developer credential, add developer signing credential. And that just generates a little key pair. Um, and it's tempting to use this from the beginning just to get up and running. Um, but what I'm here to tell you is that it's probably not a good idea because you can't deploy it anywhere. It's not going to work on Azure or anything like that. Um, and it's pretty easy just to make a cert and you know, do it properly. Um, so you may as well do that. And so to do that, we've got this bit of code above us. Uh, and what we're doing here is we're loading a certificate from the registry. It happens to be the store name my and the store location current user. And the reason for this is that this is where Azure places its certificates. So I, all of my stuff's in Azure, and I like it to work that way. So to load certificates, um, I'll give you a link to this code. In fact, what I will do if you just search Ben Carl blog or even just creating a, an entity or something like that, uh, my latest post is how to do this, okay how to create a certificate, how to uh, register it with Azure, and here's that exact same code we just saw before. Um, and how to use it with Azure App Services, because there is something you need to do. Uh, so the easiest thing to do there is just Google Ben Cull blog um, or uh, bencull.com. There's, there's a bunch of ways to find this. You could also just Google creating a science certificate. Um, but the, the, end, the end part of that goal is we load the certificate and we pass it into Identity Server. Um, the next thing I want to show you, or the next thing I want to point out, because again, this is kind of not really in the documentation either, is how to do EF migrations with multiple DB contexts, um, because that was a little bit tricky to set up. Um, has anyone here done EF? Oh, who uses Entity Framework to start? OK, it's the bulk of the room. Who uses Entity Framework migrations with EF Core? I guess you have to these days. And uh, who has used multiple contexts with EF migrations before? Perfect, that was no one. That's what I like to see. So you'll have to with this. Um, and it's not too bad. You'll notice I'm pointing all of my databases to the same, sorry, all of my connection strings to the same database. Because um, I just prefer to have it all in one spot, especially in Azure, it's cheaper. Um, and it uh, brings it together easier. So if you look at my data project, um, I've also got a blog post on how to do this as well. So I'll leave that for the blog post. But essentially what happens is you have a standard, um, sorry, a .NET standard class library. OK, this is what my data project is. And inside that, you reference Entity Framework and such. And what you need to do is add something called a temporary DB context factory. OK, so the tooling isn't quite there yet to understand how your application spins up so it knows what the database status is, so it knows how to connect into all that kind of stuff. So what you do is you add this particular uh, DB context factory, just pointing to my development copy of my database. And that way, when I run .NET EF migrations, uh, it knows where to find the database. And I've done that not only for my applications context, but also for the two contexts that Identity Server requires. OK, they all just, it's all just the same code. And again, if you go back. 
it's just the second one here, Entity Framework Core Migrations in Visual Studio 2017. Uh, and that will show you how to set up multiple contexts. But essentially, all you do is once you've got that uh, temporary database context factory, uh, you just call, and I'll just show you very briefly. Um, on your data project, you get .NET EF migrations add you know, my migration. Uh, you give it the context name, pinch context, OK? Uh, and that is going to add the migration for your own application. And you do that first. And then second, you come along and you just put in the uh, configuration DB context or whatever the context name is that you have in your database. Here, what is it called? Persisted grant DB context and configuration DB context. And what that does is it spins up the migration for the tables that Identity Server uses. You can kind of see, I apologize for the size, you can kind of see at the top right there that it's made two folders for these things. And they just have one migration in them at the moment because Identity Server hasn't changed its data, database structure yet, okay, as of 1.0. Um, but that's an important tip, is getting all your migrations set up. And probably what I'll also show you, just as a bit of a bonus, um, for starters, we needed to add Identity Server to the bottom of our authentication project startup class. It needs to go below Identity because it relies on some stuff in Identity, and it needs to go above MVC because it protects MVC. Um, and the, the bonus tip here is just this migration and seeding of the database. So there's a bunch of different ways to do this. My preferred way to uh, migrate and seed a database is to place the migration and seeding code in the configure, in the pipeline um, part of the startup class because this will run once, sorry, this will run once per startup. Uh, and the caveat is that if you've got asynchronous code, uh, it needs to run synchronously. Okay, if you try to, it, it will function if you run it asynchronously, if you use await, but it will actually break things. So uh, use the, the get a waiter. Um, on the end of your seeding stuff. Beautiful. OK, cool. So that's technically what we need to do to get Identity Server slipped into our application. Okay. The next thing we need to do is understand our architecture, and we need to start configuring you know, our Identity Server to understand our environment and our architecture. So the key things there are our um, we'll start with resources, OK? Um, for those of you who haven't used the Identity Server, there are two types of resources that it protects, information and an API resource. OK, so information or identity resources is just information about a, a user. So in this case, I've got things like their username, basic profile information, and email address. Uh, importantly, I've got a custom identity resource. Uh, in my application, uh, everyone who signs up to the website is a <laughs> uh, everyone who signs up to the website is, is a merchant, OK? Uh, and this is the information about that merchant that I want to protect or I want to give out, for example. Uh, and you can see in the user claim section here, this is the stuff I want to give out. Just some IDs and some names, so they don't have to keep looking it up out of the database every time. It's just embedded in the token. Um, so that's the identity resources. The API resources are our API 1. Uh, this is, in our earlier diagram, this is the API I want to protect, the other project. It's just the configuration of it. So, I've called it API 1. Uh, it's got a secret. Forget the secret. Uh, it's got some user claims. Uh, these are just things that I want embedded in the access token when you ask for this API. And it's got some scopes. Now, scopes is more of an OAuth uh, idea. And the thing you need to know here is that you've got to create a scope with the same name as your API. Don't worry, that's in the documentation, so that's OK. Uh, and something special I've also added is a secondary scope. 
Okay, so this holds, uh, or this gives you access to a slither of my API that I only want certain people to have. So uh, all third-party developers can have everything else, but only my Angular 2 portal has access to the API keys, because I don't want my third-party developers just taking the keys from the customers they have access to. And so, oh, I've also got a second API, but we, we won't look at that. That's OK. Um, so now that we have our resources, OK, we've mapped out uh, logically what we want to protect. The next thing we need to do is add the configuration uh, for our clients. OK, so these are things that want to connect to our API. So in my case, the, the main client is my Angular 2 application. And we'll take a look at its configuration here. OK. So when you've got a client, um, my main one is the Angular 2 application. So any client, though, that tries to connect to your API and it tries to go through Identity Server uh, will go through this client store. And this is the kind of, this is the stuff that's not quite in the documentation or not widely available anyway. Um, and this is my preferred way of implementing the client store, okay? Rather than using the database for everything, I kind of have a hybrid bit here. Um, so a client will connect using their client ID. In my case, it's PinchWeb. Uh, for the Angular 2 portal, it's PinchWeb anyway. And if we go and we take a look at the configuration of that client, okay, let's have a look here. You can see I've got a bunch of different properties. The important ones here uh, that I set the URI so I know information has to come from that website. Um, require consent is false. Okay, I don't need to ask users whether or not my portal can access my data. Okay, it's got implied consent. Um, it's got allow offline access, which lets you uh, ask for a refresh token and then refresh your access tokens over and over and over. Um, it has a secret to prove who I am. So this is the, the string you would need to pass in to say, yep, you definitely are my application. Um, and importantly here, we have allowed scopes. Now, allowed scopes, you can see here, I'm asking for the identity information I was protecting earlier. And I'm also asking for API 1, merchant, which is some identity information, and merchant API keys. Okay? So, uh, sorry, I'm not asking for it. I'm allowing that client access to that scope. Okay, so this is how you protect certain parts of your API. Uh, is through this allowed scopes. This client can, access that, uh, can access that one. And we'll contrast that now to what a third-party developer client looks like. Now, just as a quick um, just as a quick sort of context um, thing, whenever you sign up for an account, I generate uh, a merchant ID and a few keys, right? And this is just strings I've made up. I'm just saving in my merchant table. Okay, there's nothing special about any of this. Um, but that merchant ID and that secret key are what are provided to identity server to identify this client. So if I'm a third-party developer building a system and I want to use my API, um, this is the configuration that they will get. So we'll come back up to our client store. The client ID that comes in will be that merchant, uh, merchant ID that I've saved in my database. So it's not going to be any of the ones I know, like I hard code know about. It's something from the database. So I look up the merchants table and I go, OK, do, are there any merchants with a merchant ID of this one? And if there are, I get the configuration like so, given the merchant from the database, by the way. Uh, and what I can do is set up a client. I can give it its name from the database, whether or not it's enabled. So you can trigger that uh, at this point if you'd like to. Uh, important things here, the client secrets is just the secret key from the database. Again, so that's how they prove who they are using that secret key. Um, you can see here in the allowed scopes, they're allowed everything except the merchant information and the API keys scope as well. So if they try to request it, they'll be denied. And they don't have access to that area. OK, and I'm also embedding a few claims in here as well. And this is uh, just a convenience thing I'll talk about quickly. Um, I've got some data I don't want to look up every time, and I want to embed it in the token. You've got to be careful not to do this too much, otherwise it'll you know, be too large of a token. Um, but this is just stuff like their merchant ID, a couple of internal IDs, and 
um, whether or not they have permission to use the live system. It's just information that the client might like to know about the user using it. Cool. So what we'll do now is we will jump over to looking at how to protect our API, I think, first. We'll do that. OK, so by this time, um, what have we done? We've set up Identity Server. It's just a regular MVC website. We've put our Identity Server in there. We've configured it into the pipeline. We've added the, uh, the resources that we wanted to protect. And we've gone ahead and set up our client configuration so that we uh, can get third-party developers in there as well. So what we need to look at now is how to protect the API itself. And this is relatively straightforward, to be honest. So um, we can go in and add the package for access token validation. Identity server 4 might be a bit low. Access token validation. Uh, and this is what we're going to put into our pipeline to read the tokens that we get given. So if we look at startup in our API, and we'll come down to, we'll go past the MVC bits, and we'll come down to our pipeline. So you can see here again, I use the API to migrate my data. So this is the project I've chosen to kick off the migrations. Um, I've got cores in there, so everyone can use it, um, even JavaScript uh, libraries. Uh, and the thing we need to look at is identity server authentication. So uh, in the authority, that's just pointing to our identity server URL, so it knows where to go. Uh, we've got require HTTPS, yep, enable caching. I don't have a caching provider, so I haven't done that. And importantly, I'm identifying myself as API 1, and here's my secret. Uh, and once you've done that, if we look at just like a controller, uh, let's just pick this one, for example, all you need is authorize. OK, and the, all the internal mechanisms kick in at this point. Uh, and they'll make sure that everything is correct, OK? So if you're uh, in an API setting and you're using a token uh, and you don't have permission to use this uh, particular class, uh, it'll kick back a 403. Um, if you don't have a token at all, it'll kick back a 401. Uh, and essentially, the cool thing about this as well is here's that API keys method, right? It's just in the same class. I've, the only thing I've added differently here is the uh, policy, merchant API keys. And this is what protects this particular method. If we look back at our startup for the API, just back up here in the authorization section, we have a thing called add authorization, and we add a policy merchant API keys. All you have to have is a claim of scope merchant API keys, which you'll only be given if you have permission. So therefore, only my client, the Angular 2 application, can access that endpoint. Uh, and regular third-party developers can't. Beautiful. OK. Now we can dig into some of the Angular 2 stuff and how that's set up. Uh, this is a little bit more complex and a little bit more controversial, to be honest, as well. So as I mentioned before, all of my applications are running in .NET Core, and including my Angular 2 application. So if we take a look at the startup class, again, I just went file new project MVC uh, and added my Angular 2 application to this uh, project. If we come down to the pipeline of this guy, um, you'll see what we need to do to protect um, our Angular 2 app. Okay, And I'll also show you how the Angular stuff is hooked up as well. Um, so the first thing we need to do is we're using uh, a slightly different uh, authentication mechanism this time. We're not using the uh, identity server authorization one that we had on our API. Instead, we're using OIDC Connect uh, to identify ourselves from our Angular 2 application. Um, you have to put that line in, but don't worry about it. It's in the docker. Uh, things to look at here and things that are interesting. Uh, I've got a rebound on the pipeline here. Uh, who's, who's using Angular 2, actually? I wonder how much I need to explain. Yep, OK, cool. Uh, that's about a quarter of the room. The thing with Angular 2 is when you, um, it's a single page application, OK? So the only endpoint I have in this MVC website is home index. All, right? All traffic goes to there. And that home index boots up my Angular 2 application. 
Now what happens when I go into it, I'll show you this actually, it'll be easier to visualize. What happens when you actually go in and navigate around, um, we're just, you know, it's just all one page application. We're loaded. We're not doing any postbacks. Um, but our URL, and again, it's a bit hard to see, is changing as we go around, okay? So what happens when I just go and request that URL? You'll see that we are put back in the right place, okay? Now, the way that works is with this rebound stuff because the request comes in, and it's to payers slash some identifier. Okay, and this piece of middleware here, on the way in for the request, it skips it. It says, okay, I don't need to do anything on the way in. So that's that await next. Next, what it does is it goes all the way down the pipeline, all the way through our file servers, and through down to MVC, and then back up. Okay, and if, if it hasn't been found by the file servers, so there's no static files it can serve, and in our case, payers slash ID is not a file, it's just a URL. So then it makes its way down to MVC, and MVC goes, oh, I don't have a, I don't have a payers controller. That doesn't exist. Um, 404, I can't find that. So it comes all the way back up the pipeline, and this thing here goes, OK, if we get a 404 from both the file servers and the MVC side, and the path doesn't have an extension, so it's probably not a missing file, then what I want you to do is change the request path back to root, set the status code to 200, and push it back down the pipeline again. So we've got a second await next there. And that pushes it back down. File servers go, no, root, I don't have a file called you know, just slash. Um, MVC goes, ah, home index. That's linked to root. Here's home index. And so home index is rendered, which boots up my Angular 2 application. Uh, and then the URL, though, in the browser stays the same, because it doesn't know that all this happened. It just went, I want this. And it said, here it is. And so Angular 2 picks up that URL and says, ah, I have a route for this payers slash something. I'm going to load that page up. And that's why we are given the right response, essentially. And just to show you the rest of the pipeline here, you can see I'm using uh, the use file server. So that just creates WW root and serves every file in there. I've got a second use file server for my node modules. Okay, so there are a few node modules that I need to uh, expose as well. Uh, and because they're in the path slash node modules, but physically on the project, they're one folder up. So you need to add a second one of these to expose it properly. Um, so that covers all the static files and most of the Angular 2 application. Um, we use cookie auth because you have to. The OIDC stuff, um, all the tokens that we receive from Identity Server and that are stored in the cookie in this particular application. Um, uh, so we do, need to, we do need to add cookie authentication, and you'll see here right below it, we reference that cookie, so we're telling it where to store the tokens when we receive them. Uh, we're using OIDC, and the important things here are, again, you'll see this everywhere. Authority is our identity server, so we pass it that URL. Um, we say which client we are, and we prove it using our secret. In our case, we're using code and token. Um, so we're using a hybrid flow. I don't have time to get into that one. Um, but essentially, we're just requesting tokens. Uh, we're saving those tokens into the cookie. And, and that's really it, basically. Just pointed at that kind of stuff. And just below here, so all this was doing was setting up a, 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 a variable. Um, and just below it, here's where we request what we want. OK, so we're in our Angular 2 portal right now. We're saying, please give me these scopes. And you'll see Merchant API keys there and offline access as well, which is important, so we can get our refresh token. Um, and we will be allowed, because we've proven that we are Pinch Web, that special client, and we've given it our key so that we definitely know who we are. All right, so I will also just show you briefly the home controller. The way we protect our MVC application is exactly the same. Authorize, just at the top, that's it. And that's going to handle the uh, request coming in, going, oh, you're not authenticated, kicking you over to the identity server to log in, uh, logging you in, kicking you back, taking the token from the response, and then passing it down to your application. Which is the next place I want to show you. Um, so all the steps I've just shown you here are just how to secure an MVC website. Okay? There's nothing special to Angular yet. Um, you could do that just for regular MVC sites, and you'd be done, actually, by now, which is great. 
Um, but when you want to embed Angular 2 into an MVC website, you've got to do one more or a few more things. And what we'll do is go through that. Um, so the best way is to start with Home Index. So Home Index is the only endpoint, basically. And you can see a couple others, but they're not used. Um, inside Home Index is the familiar what you'd normally put into an index HTML. Okay, it's just the root of our application. Um, nothing really special there. I won't dive too deep into how Angular works, but what we will look at is the layout file for Home Index. Uh, so the important part is, and I'll just give you a brief look at the whole file, just so you've got some context there. Uh, all we're really doing is loading a bunch of CSS, uh, loading a few node modules bits that I needed, rendering the body there, and then loading all of the scripts that I need, as well as bootstrapping the application. Now, this is, this is the bootstrapping here. Um, I guess one of the upsides and maybe downsides as well uh, is I'm using System.js to boot my Angular 2 application. Okay? And it's a bit of last year's technology these days. Everyone's uh, using Webpack and the Angular CLI to build their applications. But I'm not really a fan of how you then are taken out of uh, Visual Studio and you need to use the Node web server uh, and let Webpack do its magic. I, I like a little bit more explicit uh, control over these things. Um, and so I am sticking to System.js because I can control everything through Gulp, uh, including bundling and minification and all that kind of stuff. You explicitly write it. And whether that's a bonus for you or a detriment, that's up to you. Um, but one thing I can do, and I'm quite happy about it, I can just control F5 in my MVC project and it all just works. Uh, and given the power of a backend, if I need to do something like uh, for Facebook sharing, you need to render straight HTML. You can't give out JavaScript, it won't accept it. Uh, and so I can catch things like that. And I've got a powerful backend that can then deliver something else other than the app if I need to. Um, as a bit of an aside, basically what we're doing here is booting the Angular 2 application. So at development time, I'm using a non bundled version of the app. And at production time, I'm using a bundled version of the app. So it's much smaller and much quicker. Uh, but for debugging, it's not very nice to have a bundled uh, application. The key kind of trick here, I guess, is this line. I'm using a view component to uh, render my settings down to my Angular 2 application. OK, so if we take a quick look at that, you'll see some of the magic coming out. So this view component, uh, every time the page runs, which typically is just once at the beginning for a single page app, um, what I'm doing is I'm using the authentication context, pulling out the access token, my current access token, the current ID token, which contains the identity resources. I'm also pulling out the refresh token. So my MVC app can go and fetch as many access tokens as I want. And this is probably another big benefit if you're more into security, is that my refresh tokens are never exposed to the client. Okay, the MVC backend is the only thing that sees a refresh token. So you could make your access token expiry really small if you wanted to kind of mitigate people stealing keys or sniffing keys or something like that. Uh, it will only ever last as long as you set your access token expiry to. Uh, and then it's pretty simple. I'm just building a model and I'm putting some data in it. So I'm, I've got some base URLs that I want to give to the client so it knows where, to, where the API is and where the authentication server is. Um, I keep the tokens just in the back end, and then I add a bit, bunch of other information that I don't want to call um, from the database every, you know, every time. Instead, I'm just using the current, uh, the context version of these. Uh, and if we take a look at the view, I'm just hard coding a bit of a settings file um, and just rendering that information in. So that's just a, a global variable, basically, in JavaScript. Uh, and because I did it just before the, um, that gets rendered here, so a global variable gets rendered here just before my Angular 2 app loads, so that in my Angular 2 application, if we go to... Oops. Um, I just have a service. Uh, stock standard service here, Angular 2 service, that reads the magic variable. So load settings here. This is called once. Um, yeah, it maps the magic global variable stuff to a typed variable uh, that I can then expose to the rest of my application, uh, which is quite powerful. And I've got, I've got 10 minutes to show you something pretty cool as well. Now, just before I show you the cool thing, and probably while it's loading, 
Um, does anyone have any questions about things? I know that's a lot of information to absorb. Uh, does anyone have any questions about anything uh, they didn't quite catch or anything like that? No, cool, blown away. Oh, yeah, we've got one there. Yep. They only have access to their own data. Uh, so the question was, if a user gains access to their access token, yeah. they could use that to try and get other people's data from the system. Good question, good question. Um, so the way that's handled in my application, Uh, okay, cool. The, the way I'm handling this, um, and I guess the best place to start is to show you the no, authentication. Um, when I configured my identity server up here, okay, uh, you might have noticed these three lines down here. And this is a couple of service implementations I've overridden uh, from the default ones. And the client store is one of them. So when I was showing you all that client information stuff, that's a, a special one. The other one is a profile service. Uh, and the job of a profile service is to uh, take the currently logged in user. Because remember, identity server knows who's logged in. Um, it's to take that user and it's to create claims from that data. Uh, and here, I've got an ASP.NET identity profile service. I had to write one because there, there wasn't one before I wrote this, but there's a built-in one now. So by default, you'll get things like um, their, their user ID is a claim, um, and the username and email, all these built-in ASP.NET ones, right? They, they all get given to you for free. So they'll be in the token if you ask for them. Uh, and more importantly, I kind of override that as well. Uh, and I hit the database to pull out any claims I need as well. So I guess if you come down here, not this one, pinch profile service. So I also, um, when a user is authenticated at the time that they, they log in, uh, these claims are also embedded in the token. Uh, so you can see how I've got uh, test submerchant ID and live submerchant ID. Uh, okay. Uh, in my API, as a convention, uh, no, not that one. Okay. Uh, this is a base controller. All my controls inherit from this one. And what I do is I look in the, the current HTTP context, and I'm looking for a, uh, a merchant context if I haven't already put one in. But essentially what's happening here is when you ask for the submerchant ID of the current user, it's going to go ahead and look for uh, Yeah, it's going to go ahead and pull this out of the current context. And it's going to pick either the live submerchant ID or the test submerchant ID from the claims. Uh, so they're, since they're set at authentication time, basically all of my code has a, oops, uh, all of my services code just has a where submerchant ID equals this. And uh, yeah, that forces it basically. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Uh, any other questions before I just move on? Yes? Correct. Great question. OK, so the question was, uh, the refresh token is not given to the client. Therefore, how am I refreshing my tokens? Excellent point. Uh, there's actually, again, in the web project this time, so the Angular 2 MVC application, there is a little endpoint in my account controller here called refresh tokens. Uh, and that does what you might think. So uh, we basically take the current tokens out of the authentication context. Uh, 
that line 51 um, is the identity server code itself. Okay, so this is code they've written where all you need to do is pass in the refresh token um, given some settings. That's a bit hard to read with that. Oops. So we create a token client. This token client is an identity server class. We give it some settings such as the identity server, the client ID, and the client secret. And then we call request refresh token. We'll get back a token. Uh, and you can see here, basically, I take the old token uh, and the new one and the refresh token, and I jam it all into a new uh, context. Uh, what is it? Yeah, this is it here. Uh, claims principle, sorry. Basically, this guy updates MVC, so it knows, aha, this is the current authentication context. And then I just return JSON with the new access token. And that's it. So that goes back down to the Angular application. And probably one last thing to look at is the authenticated HTTP service I've got here. Uh, this is an Angular 2 service. And what this does is it wraps every HTTP call in a retry, um, given that, and it knows how to basically refresh the token. So I'll come down here and pretty much, where's the best one to look at? I guess, for example, get. So you can call get with any URL, uh, and then it turns that request into like a Lambda function, basically. Uh, and it executes it, and it will refresh the tokens if it didn't work. Um, so stepping through that, I add an authentication bearer header to each request. That's how the API knows who I am. That's how you pass the token to it. Uh, and that refresh method here, a uh, little bit tricky. This is some observable, observable fun, but basically, we take the request we wanted to do, we execute it, we catch the error if it happens to give us a 401. Then what we do is we call refresh tokens, so it makes a separate call off to that MVC endpoint, gets the new token back, and then adds it to the original request and, requ and fires it off a second time, basically. Um, which works uh, pretty much all the time. Uh, the reason I say pretty much all the time is because when you load my application, for example, if you happen to land here, there's several calls that go off to load the data for this page. And if your token is expired, it does it all at once. So it'll hit refresh tokens three times all at once. And it, yeah, I'll get the 401, three of, three of them all at once. I'll refresh the tokens all at once. And that can cause Identity Server to get into a bit of a fuss if you don't set the refresh token, and this is going to be a bit of a jump around, uh, up in my, sorry, client store. For pinch web, so this is the client configuration, and you'll see refresh token <laughs> to do, consider better approach. <laughs> um, Refresh token is set to reuse, which means when you use the refresh token to get a new access token, it doesn't also give you a new refresh token, because when I call it three times at once, all of a sudden I'm in this big mess, whereas if I get the same refresh token back each time, it makes three successful calls and just changes access tokens really quickly. But they all work. Um, and the great thing is you can set this up per client. So maybe I want my internal app to work that way, but if I want third-party developers to have a better way of doing it, I could set that to a different configuration. Cool. Um, I'll take questions at the end as well. Uh, I know it's been a long day. Um, the last thing I want to show you, it's just something a little bit fun, is uh, the SDK. Okay, I wrote an SDK basically to make things easier for um, developers to use my system, right? Now, what was fun about this and what's cool about uh, Identity Server is there's something there's the concept of connect built in as well. So up until now, third-party developers have built their own system, they have their own keys, and they access their own data. But if you've ever used something like Stripe or PayPal or some, a very large API where you want to build a system that uses other people's accounts, right? And you want to connect to their account and get keys for their account rather than your own. 
Um, and this is actually built in. This is what my system does as well. So if you look at the, uh, I don't know, the keys page, you'll see this concept of an application ID on the right-hand side. And what this lets you do is, like, if you've ever seen uh, something like Twitter, if you made a Twitter or a Facebook application, you create a bit of information, and then when a third-party application wants to use your Twitter account, it'll say, hey, so-and-so application wants to use your Twitter. Do you, cons you know, do you give consent? And it'll say, let me tweet. Let me read tweets or give me my email. So that consent sort of workflow is actually built into Identity Server as well. And to demonstrate this, let's just connect a pinch. So it was a very, very prototype-based screen here. This is given to you. I've kind of half styled it a little. Uh, but this is built for you. And you can see here, um, you can configure all this stuff as well. So I'm asking for their identifier. I can choose whether or not to give them merchant info, all right, whether I want to con uh, concede to that. Uh, I want API 1 access, and I want offline access. And I can remember that decision as well. And if I go, yes, allow, uh, all of a sudden, what's happened here is my third-party application, this is a, technically what some developer could go build, now has access to the, my claims. Okay? It's logged in as me. Um, whoops. Yeah, that's probably the best way to describe it, basically. So the user has logged in. Before that consent screen, I was already logged in, but I could have logged in as any other user. And what would happen is I would get the details of that user in my third-party application here. And it's, it's all the same. There's no difference to using the API. You still send an access token. You've still got a, a refresh token. And you've just got some claims that you can read. Uh, and that's something that I think is really cool. And it's built in. But wary of time, basically, what we've looked at today is some basic how to set up identity server stuff. Uh, we'll take a look at, at authentication, and we've kind of really ramped up to a scenario that's very specific to me. But you've got to see a couple of the cool things you can do and some of the challenges you'll face when you uh, go to do this yourself. Uh, the best place to see information about identity server and my blog posts and stuff like that is just to Google Ben Cole's blog. You'll find information there. And thank you very much for coming to NDC. It's been a pleasure. If you have questions, feel free to come up and have a chat. <laughs>